Welcome to Christianity and Ethics, Class 20, Religious Studies 3396. Uh, let me do a couple of uh, house cleaning things before we get started. For one thing, as we've gone along in the study of Christian ethics, you'll notice that uh, I uh, tell lots of stories. The way I, the way I became an expert on uh, sin is by being a sinner, and so I like to tell some of the stories that, uh, from my own life that illustrate. And uh, uh, these are not uh, these are not old wives' tales, but they are also not scientific uh, conclusions or scientific explanations. What I've been trying to communicate is that when you're dealing with the Bible and with the Christian faith and with Christian ethics, the way that you the way you understand things better is is through story. And every once in a while, I've made reference to some story that's going on in contemporary culture. In fact, if you looked at uh, if you look at any newspaper, if you'd look, for instance, at last Sunday's newspaper. There are two very, two or three very important ethical questions that are the front page news. One of them has to do with the uh, so with some recent scientific studies that had to do with uh, the soul in the traditional, not in the traditional sense, but the soul in the sense in which modern science can still talk about there being a soul, and these. Um, these studies had to do with the fact that the human brain is a physical entity. You can study it physically. You can study it phys uh, medically. You can study it as though it were an object within nature. Now, lots of Christians don't like to study the brain as if it were an object within nature because they're still holding on to the old Neoplatonic idea that the soul is a kind of a thing that's not really directly connected with nature, with, with the human body. And as a result, lots of people, including lots of modern popular Christianity, as well as lots of modern uh, uh, scientific perspectives on the human being, are, are, believe that they have just uh, that that uh, that uh, the human body and what happens to the human body is not really relevant to ethics. And what this study made uh, made clear was that that human will sometimes seems to be an illusion. Well, it is sometimes an illusion if we think of human will as being kind of a, an entity safe from any relationship to the human body. For instance, in Descartes, the soul or the human will was located in the pineal gland. In other words, it was somewhere deep down in the human body, but it really wasn't that connected to the human body. The human body was a machine, and the soul was a ghost in the machine. Now, this, this Cartesian understanding of the soul is actually what has influenced a great deal of both Christian and anti-Christian conception of the soul and of free will and of Christian eth and of ethics uh, for a long time. And one thing that one thing that Christians need to learn is that if you stick a pin in a human brain, it changes the person. If you stick a pin in a human brain, for instance, that person is liable to slug you. Well, from a moralistic perspective, that is a sin. But if you understand the, the uh, biblical, and if you understand the biblical conception of the human being as a body, and as not not just a spirit, then the fact that you can stick a pin in a human brain and cause some changes in the way human beings act is actually very consistent with the Christian view of, of ethics. 
and the Christian view of sin and the Christian view of the human being. And so that has to be taken into consideration. In other words, the Christian view of sin and of ethics is ironically more compatible with the modern scientific view of the human brain than the old Neoplatonic view in which the soul is a kind of a ghost in the machine. And the only thing that is, that is, uh, that is burdening down the soul is the human body. And therefore, most of what we do that's bad is what we do in response to our sensual nature, to our sexual nature, and so forth. And that has been a very bad confusion in Christianity. Anyway, that article uh, brought up a point which I've tried to make in reference to discussions of alcoholism and in, in uh, reference to discussions of people going on trial in our justice system for certain acts and lawyers uh, on each side then will try to prove that the person is responsible for what he's done because nothing in his brain has had any effect on it. Well, uh, you can go at that two different ways. You can assume that since the brain does have the chemicals in the brain and the, and the fissures that have developed in the brain do have something to do with the way a person thinks and the way a person acts. You can therefore say nobody is responsible for anything he or she has ever done. Or you can take the kind of moralistic soul perspective of a lot of traditional people and say that there is no reason to even talk about chemicals in the brain and fissures in the brain because everybody is completely responsible for whatever they do. And neither one of those is the Christian understanding of sin. Uh, in Christian ethics, one of the things that goes into making ethical decisions is what you might call reason or wisdom. In other words, the fact that Christian ethics does not arise out of reason, that it arises out of a revelation, does not mean that it does not use reason and use wisdom. Wisdom, for instance, in the, in the case of these scientific studies, to try to understand how a human being is. First of all, the Christian is not supposed to be as judgmental of other human beings as the traditional doctrine of the soul implies. That's not the job of Christian ethics, is to be judgmental of other people. The job of Christian ethics, as I hope you're getting with your paper on Christian love, is to, is to relate to other people in a disinterested way. And if you relate to other people in a disinterested way, you might discover that part of their problem has to do with the fact that uh, their oxygen was su supply was cut off when they were born, or their uh, brain has undergone some transformation because they've uh, inhaled some inhalants or because they've been on some drug. And any drug that changes the brain uh, has the possibility of changing the brain per uh, permanently. And so a great deal of the misery that human beings experience arises out of what the Christian doctrine of sin means. But that does not necessarily mean that we are, that people who do not have these chemical imbalances in the brain or people who do not have these fissures in the brain uh, are in any, in any position to be self-righteous, that is to be judgmental about the problems of other people. One of the things that... Uh, that you should have gotten from reading the chapter on sin is that if you understand the Christian conception of disinterested love, then you should be able to understand what sin is, because what is sin? If you look at page 290, if the reader will call to mind what has been said in earlier chapters of this book concerning the nature of Christian love, it will be possible to give in a few words several summary definitions of what sin means. As I said, the word has become so useless in many ways, uh, people just laugh when you use the term these days. They don't laugh when they actually come face to face confrontationally with sin and even with the demonic. They don't laugh it, but when they hear the word, uh, it kind of reminds them of uh, traditional uh, 
old fogey puritanical or Victorian religion. And so, but so what uh, Ramsey is trying to get us to see is that if you understand what Christian love means, then you understand what sin is because it's the flip side. So if a, if a reader will call to mind what has been said in early chapters of this book concerning the nature of Christian love, it, it will be possible to give in a few words several summary definitions of what sin means. What, in other words, if you studied love, you know what sin means. Namely, the opposite of all that Christian love means. Any falling short of disinterested love for neighbor for his own sake, love cut to the measure of Christ's love, any falling short of the strenuous teachings of Jesus, any falling short of the full definition of obligation contained in 1 Corinthians 13, this is what Christians meant when Christians speak of man as sinful. If we ought to have faith effective through word, love, or faith working through love, then sin means pride or anxiety, the opposite of faith. You remember when Jesus uh, talks about you should be anxious for nothing? Uh, that's not because he's just trying to get you to relax and take a deep breath. That's because anxiety is the opposite of faith. Uh, that doesn't mean that anybody who has faith can get rid completely of anxiety. He cannot do it. But as he experiences his anxiety, he needs to recognize it as part of the problem of faith. So sin is pride or anxiety working through selfishness. What causes a person to sin? By stealing somebody's money. Pride working through our anxiety, working through selfishness. What causes a person uh, who is not even guilty of breaking any particular laws, but he spends his whole life uh, unethically relating to people so that he will be sure to have a financial security at the end of his work tenure? That's anxiety expressing itself uh, in selfishness, in self-centeredness. What will cause a person to, um, to make a preemptive strike to a fellow co-worker or even to a boss to try to make sure that uh, he doesn't get hurt? Well, that's anxiety uh, expressing itself in selfishness. So if this be the meaning of sin, there is nothing really so astounding in the Christian judgment concerning the universality and totality of sin in the flesh. There's nothing astounding about sin. It's not a, uh, just a made-up term. It's actually a description of something, a description of something real. That is, the failure of disinterested Christian love. On page uh, 288, he says that one thing, the second thing that should be said concerning the Christian understanding of sin is that this is no ad hoc judgment upon man rendered in some moment of gloom by theologians who should be psychoanalyzed instead of being believed. Unfortunately, that's, that's the way a lot of uh, ethicists and theologians are thought of, as though they just... Uh, are grumpy, got up on the wrong side of the bed, they don't have any faith in, in human capacity and so forth. The idea of sin is not a conclusion reached simply from analyzing the capacities and propensities within human nature as such. Temperament and the mood of the observer having decisive effect on the matter. It is rather a conclusion to which Christian thought is forced from viewing man in the light of God as Christians know him. Specifically in Christianity, viewing human beings in the light of Jesus Christ. So at the deepest level, the doctrine of sin has least to do with mankind in general, most to do with oneself in particular. Now notice this quotation from Kierkegaard. He comes up, he's still coming up a lot. When the individual then is foolish enough to inquire about sin as about something irrelevant to him, he speaks as a fool. Now, what does it mean to inquire about sin as something irrelevant to him? 
What it means is to be able, which we are extremely good at doing, to see the sin in other people. We are extremely, it's extremely di very difficult for us to see the sin in ourselves. And, uh, but it's very easy for us to see the sin in other people. It's easy for people who don't believe in sin, for instance, to see the sin in those who do believe in sin. It's, it's, uh, it's uh, easy for people who believe that religion always produces self-righteousness to always see on self-righteous only in religious people. Self-righteousness only in religious people. Because part of, the, uh, par part of the character of sin is that it is self-deception. So Christian ethics doesn't begin with preaching sin, the doctrine of sin, to other people. Christian ethics cannot even relate the doctrine of sin to other people unless it has already related the doctrine of sin to himself or, her, or herself. Either he does not know, if he thinks that sin is something that he's talking, if, for instance, society. On television all day long you can hear people talking about, well, how bad society is getting. Well, somewhere along the line, we've got to get to the point where we realize that society is us. <laughs> it's society is me. And, and there are actions and reactions in society. There are actions and reactions in the family. There are actions and reactions in the relationship between a man and his wife. There are actions and reactions in relationship between human beings of all kinds. And these actions participate in the sin that originates in me. I also know it originates in you, but that's not the primary thing I need to know. The primary thing I need to know is that it originates in me. Otherwise, racism is something that another group is guilty of. When I first uh, started teaching on ethics, one of the things that I did I, I did a few kind of personalistic exper experiments in class. For instance, if I had 40 or 50 people in class, I'd ask them, now I want everyone in here who really believes he is a racist to raise your hand. Well, if you had 50 people in class, how many do you think would raise their hand? None. Well, you might wonder then, if there's nobody who is a racist, where are the racists? Well, the problem is people are understanding racism as something that's outside themselves, something that, uh, that another group of people are guilty of. Because racism's, racism um, manifests itself in certain historical conditions in, in different ways. For instance, uh, in the United States and in England, racism has manifest, well, let's, let's just use the United States. In the United States, res, racism has manifested itself in the following way because of the history of the United States. That is, racism manifested itself immediately when European people hit the shores of America. How did it manifest itself? Because there were already some people here, and we still sometimes talk about, you know, uh, Columbus discovered America, or, or the Puritans came and, and established uh, a civilization in America. What we mean by that is, is something very racist. It's, th it's as though there were nobody already here. It's as though that the people were here were not intelligent enough to have any kind of civilization and so forth. So that is a natural tendency of even people who are of the best character of England, because that's who the Puritans were. They were, pure, they were people who wanted more than anything in the world to be godly, moral people, and yet they got here. And, uh, and all of their relationships with Native Americans was not as, uh, as, uh, as uh, just totally miserable as sometimes we let on. And one of the reasons is, is because we have the tendency, modern historians and modern Americans have the tendency, to be able to see very clearly the sins of the Puritans. Because we're not taking any time to understand that sin originates in me. And that's the reason why it was in the Puritans. Because the Puritans are like me. They are human beings who, no matter how 
uh, no matter how uh, much they may have convinced themselves of their righteousness and their goodwill, they still have something inside them that will cause them to have the tendency um, that breaks out. Now, it doesn't really, it doesn't break out immediately. In other words, the Puritans didn't storm the beaches cutting uh, Native Americans' heads off. They probably advanced very slowly and wanted to make friends with the Native Americans. But making friends with a culture so different from yours as the Native Americans were is a hard thing to do. And very, very easily you're going to fall into conflicts, cultural conflicts. That still happens today. Uh, my, uh, 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 there's a lot of intermarriage that goes on in the United States, you know. Uh, there always has been. And intermarriage puts two cultures together. And people who intermarry discover that no matter how much they love each other, two cultures are trying to intermingle there. And so the son-in-law better be very careful about how he relates to the mother-in-law or the father-in-law because they are of a different culture. Now that's not just true of, say, for instance, an intermarriage between a black and a white because in many ways uh, blacks and whites in America are closer culturally for instance, than uh, blacks, uh, or whites, and uh, uh, people from central Mexico, or whites and people from Iraq, or whites and people from, from some other countries. Uh, or, as in, this, as in my, mo my own marriage, which I mentioned to you before, my wife and I are both white. Both of us are kind of mongrel uh, mixture of English and Brit uh, British and uh, Irish and Wel Welch and Scottish and all those kind of things and Native American. But even though we are so basically the same, people would say they're of the same culture, even the fact that we were raised in different families that come from different parts of the United States means that to a certain extent there are culture differences there that make it very difficult to establish easy relationships with in-laws. You know, we have jokes about in-laws all the time. And we don't realize that these jokes are jo jokes about the conflicts of culture. So no matter how close you are, no matter how, how far away you are, you're going, to have, you're going to have a very difficult time overcoming the gaps between human beings. And if you don't understand that you are the sinner, then you will always assume that it's your mother-in-law that's the sinner or that it's, it's your wife that's the sinner. And uh, so you've got to get her shaped up, or you've got to get uh, them shaped up, because you're already, of course, shaped up. Every, every view you have is the one that they should have. Every attitude you have is the one that they should accept. Because, uh, you know, I'm good at heart. If I'm so good at heart, then how in the world do they have so much problems with me? Um, so anyway, I asked people to raise their hands if they're racist, and nobody raised their hands. I ended last, the last class period by referring to the revival of South Pacific. Have any of you have heard of that play? Uh, it's a musical. And South Pacific takes place on uh, the island of Bali. And part, one of the things that South Pacific deals with is racism. That's not the primary thing that, that uh, South Pacific deals with. But one of the things it deals with is racism. And one of the songs in South Pacific is, a man has fallen in love with a Bali woman. And of course, uh, she, he's a Frenchman and she's Bali, so that's a, that's a very drastic cultural uh, combination. Uh, and so the man is singing you have to be carefully taught. I'm not going to sing it. If you'll give me a dollar, I won't sing it. You have to be carefully taught. What he's saying is that racism is not something that human beings will naturally gravitate to because of their self-centeredness. Because the kind of enlightenment, Tarzan view of human nature 
is that all of us are born beautiful little flowers. And if our parents didn't corrupt us, and our society didn't corrupt us, we, none of us would be self-centered. We would be open and sharing and so forth. Uh, I have a six-week-old grandson, and he's the most beautiful thing in the world. You'll just have to take my word for it. And I love him. But there's nobody in the room more self-centered than he is. So what he has to be taught is not to be self-centered. What does he have to be taught? He has to be taught to share. You don't have to teach children to not share. If you walk in the room, you're going to find them not sharing. What you have to teach children is to share. And all of the other things that cause disturbances between human beings also have to be taught. Because if you have people of two very different races who are not prepared psychologically to relate to each other because they don't think of, they think of the other race or the other culture as being the one that's weird. And they don't realize that they themselves are the weird ones. <laughs> then you're going to have these problems. Uh, I underline that again with, with some stories from my own history. When I was um, a teacher down in the, on the border, I was born and raised on the border where two cultures Two, uh, two cultures which were at that time much different than they are now. And so there was a clash there. And the racism that, that was predominant on the border where I was raised had nothing to do with black and white because there were almost no blacks, no African Americans in town. The only Americans, Ameri Amer African Americans in the town where I grew up were named Mitchell because they had come to the valley with my grandfather from Tennessee. They were the only ones there. And interestingly enough, uh, the church where I was raised was probably one of the few integrated churches in the South. You can't get any farther south than where I was raised and still stay, on, stay dry. You know, you, you're either going to get wet or you're going to go into Mexico. But our church was completely integrated with blacks. But it wasn't integrated with Mexican-Americans. So that's where the tension was there. In, in New York, the tension may be between uh, uh, non-Jewish Europeans and Jewish Europeans. Or it might between, be between English and Irish. Now, the conflict between English and Irish is nothing in comparison to the misery of the conflict between whites and blacks were in America. But there's still conflict there. And a lot of Irish people still feel the horror of that conflict. And that's what's going on in Northern Ireland today. Uh, but anyway, where I was raised, uh, I was teaching in a school and a guy that I really liked came down to teach from Macon, Illinois. And he noticed a few things in the valley. This was at the height, this was at the beginning, the, during the height of the uh, beginning of the Civil Rights Movement. This was during the work of Martin Luther King and so forth. So he had his, had his consciousness raised. And he was from Illinois. So he had, he had actually gone down to the South and marched in some of the marches. Uh, I had marched myself, but I had marched in migrant workers' marches for, you know, for Spanish-speaking people who were paid you know, 15 cents, 20 cents, 40 cents an hour for doing things down there. But I had, I had nev never gone to the South and marched in, uh, in black marches. But he had gone to the South and marched in black marches. So every t he came down to the valley, and everything he saw in the valley was kind of a reflection of, of uh, racism toward blacks, which I never noticed because there weren't any blacks. You know, <laughs> how do you? But there were some names and so forth. And so he would get all excited. Well, I appreciated his intentions because I would agree with him. But the, the problem was I learned while I was a friend of his just by accidentally reading. He was always talking about the no-stop towns in the South. You know what a no-stop town was? That was a town where uh, African Americans driving through a town were not allowed to stop. 
there were some where you could drive through town and you could stop for gas. And you could even go to a restroom if you knew some, some place where you could go. But there were some towns that were, just got so fed up with having black people stop in town that they declared themselves to be no-stop towns. And this guy had heard of these towns in the South, and it just blew his mind. Uh, unfortunately, I read a book on Illinois and found out that Macon, Illinois was a non-stop town during the 30s. And that began my study of, uh, of relative racism. And what I discovered, for instance, was that, the, that a lot of the rhetoric going on at the time of the Civil Rights Movement, and uh, uh, I, was a, I was a member of the Southern Leadership Conference when I was a minister in the Valley, uh, which was enough to have gotten me hanged in some parts of the South, but it didn't get, didn't get me in trouble then. But uh, one of the things I discovered is the historical history, the history, for instance, of the Ku Klux Klan. Because during the Civil Rights Movement, the Ku Klux Klan kind, kind of came to the ascendancy in the South. And people still to this day associate the Ku Klux Klan almost entirely with the South. But if you study the history of the Ku Klux Klan, you realize that the greatest power of the Ku Klux Klan was not during the Civil Rights Movement in the South. It was during the 20s and 30s in the United States. That's when hundreds of thousands of Ku Klux Klan people went to Washington, D.C. and marched. And most of these people were from the North, not from the South. The largest, the largest membership of the Ku Klux Klan in the 1930s was Illinois. This doesn't absolve the South from their participation in the Ku Klux Klan, it's just as horrible whoever does it. But what I'm saying is that in terms of numbers, the highest number of members of the Ku Klux Klan in the 30s were from Illinois, and most of them were from Chicago. And most of the, most of the uh, lynchings or murders that took place in Chicago were not uh, necessarily against uh, African Americans, because the Ku Klux Klan hated everybody, you know, it wasn't just, it wasn't just an African American problem. So in the North, where there weren't nearly as many at the time uh, African Americans in the general population, and that's when it started growing in the 20s and 30s, uh, the Ku Klux Klan were, uh, was just as hateful to Catholic Polish people, for instance. So the Ku Klux Klan got into unions. And so if you were a Catholic Pole, uh, you were just as liable to be uh, assailed or assaulted by the Ku Klux Klan as if you were a black person. There, were, there was only one southern state in the twin, in 30s, 20s and 30s, that was in the top 10 of membership in the Ku Klux Klan. Guess which state that was? Texas. So again, I had this, <laughs> I had this ammunition when I would go into my class, I would say, you know, this was still when the Civil Rights Movement was going on fairly heatedly. I would say, which states do you think have the largest membership of the Ku Klux Klan? And of course, immediately Mississippi and Alabama would be listed. Mississippi and Alabama from the 20s and 30s were never in the top 10. The Ku Klux Klan in Mississippi and Alabama were horrible people. <laughs> But they didn't have near as many Ku Klux Klan members in Mississippi and Alabama as they had in Illinois, Missouri, and places like that. Now, what's the point of all that? The point of all that is not to defend the South against racism, because you can't defend the South against racism. The point of all that is to make the point which Martin Luther King understood, because Martin Luther King was a student of Paul Ramsey and of Rhino Niebuhr and of Christian ethics. And that is that, that every person in the South is a sinner and m many of them are racist. But the problem is every person in Illinois and in Massachusetts, it's also a sinner. 
And so if you ever have any problems in conflicts between races and cultures, as they did in Boston long after Martin Luther King, then you're going to have the sa much of the same kind of, of hatred and so forth. Because when we talk about races, we don't begin with ourselves. And that's what Martin Luther King was trying to tell, tell us. That's the reason why Martin Luther King was able to forgive white racists a little bit better than uh, some other folks. And that's because he began with himself. He was a Christian theologian. He began with himself. Sin, sin begins right here. And that's the reason why he didn't believe that he had the right to, to execute violence against white racists because white racists were sinners. And besides that, a large number of people in the South did not participate in Ku Klux Klan type racism. They still kind of had racist leftovers, and they still kind of have racist leftovers. You know, there's still a great deal of racism in American schools. But if you're looking at overt racism, there is probably less racism in those schools that went in the South that went through the Civil Rights Movement, such as in Houston and in Atlanta and places like that. There's probably less racist conflict in those schools than there are in schools in California and in, and in the North. That's not because Southerners are less racist than those people. It's because Southerners have gone through a very traumatic conflict and have been able to learn how to live with each other a little bit better, not as well as they should, but a little bit better. So that's what Christian ethics means by original sin, universal sin. If you don't understand that universal means you, then you're going to be actually contributing to the problem by going out with your flags and your guns and, and trying to... Uh, trying to win for this side or the other. And that's why Martin Luther King uh, became, was so unpopular. But he wasn't just unpopular among Ku Klux Klan and right, white racists. He was also unpopular among who else? He became very unpopular among a great many African Americans. Because from their perspective, he was not self-righteous enough. He was not angry enough to actually call for people to go home and get their shotguns and shoot white people. Because he understood that what that was was simply a, uh, a perpetuating of violence and a perpetuating of racism. That's the same kind of thing I was talking about the other day that happened in the French Revolution. You know, you, you figure they're the good guys and the bad guys. If you're in, um, if you're in uh, Selma, Alabama in the 50s and 60s, the good guys are the African Americans, the bad guys are the white Americans. If you're in uh, Uganda, <laughs> you know, the good guys are the African, the, uh, well, let me, let me put it this way. If you're in Uganda, racism has a tendency to express itself most violently in the other direction. Because uh, colonialism has basically lost in Africa. And so Africans have been set free, so to speak, from the, from the, uh, from, uh, from the colonialism. And yet, uh, does that mean that hatred and misery has disappeared from Africa? In other words, if you just set a group of people free, whether they're white or whether they're black, does that mean that they're going to treat each other right? No. There has to be some more basic thing involved. And so uh, that's the reason why the United States made, even though everybody recognizes that we still are not where we should be in terms of race relations, in the United States, and in fact, in some ways, things have gotten worse on the ground. Um, we can still understand that 
not only are, have things not become perfect, but there's another little verse under that, and that is things will never be perfect. Why? Because I'm a sinner, and you're a sinner. So we just have to work hard. We just have to work hard. But we have to, we have to quit being self-righteous about one another. Now this made a th this was very important to me 20 years ago because I was raised uh, in far south Texas, and uh, I'm just like everybody else. I assumed I had a good heart. In fact, my family, uh, my family, I thought, was almost devoid of racism because uh, we were migrant workers and we were members of a small holiness church uh, in which I never saw any anti-racism or anti-Semitism or anything like that. And, uh, and I was real proud of my mother because she would uh, have, she would have uh, African Americans and Mexican Americans, uh, laborers, illegal aliens, in to supper any time they were in her yard. She would have, she would have them in to supper. And some of them would refuse to go. One of them would say, and this was, this was a, a guy named Grant. We used to call Uncle Grant. He was Uncle Grant Mitchell. He had come down to the valley with my grandfather. But even he would not come in and eat supper with my mother because he says, oh, no, I know my place, you know. So I was real proud of my mother. And so I, I kind of reacted when people came from the north and just assumed that everybody in the south was a horrible racist just because they were born and raised in the South. And so I kind of got my back up. Well, uh, that's part of my education. The second part of my education is that I began to realize that, that uh, I have no self-righteousness to offer. I have no self-righteousness to offer because the same thing that is in an overt racist is in me. And I have to watch it. I have to know. And, I, and, I, and I've found myself in situations where I am just as uneasy and uncomfortable with a person of another race, especially if it's of another culture. A culture is actually more important than race. If a person of another culture, I'm uneasy. It, it's difficult for me to, as educated as I am, you know, I have four degrees, but as educated as I am, it's still very difficult for me to uh, become easy in these inter interracial relations. Now, I've confessed my sin. How about you? Isn't that the same with you? That, that through our lives we've had difficulties uh, being, feeling easy. We felt uneasy. Well, you add that uneasiness and that difference in culture, you add to that ignorance and selfishness and racism, and you got a mess. So what people need to be taught is to share. They need to be taught that no matter how you feel when you come into contact with a group of people, uh, your, your focus should not be on how you feel but your focus should be on doing good to them. And that's what we mean by saying that Christian, in Christianity, love, disinterested love, and sin are the opposites. Uh, sometimes, think that, sometimes people think that the opposite of, of, sin, of sin is morality. That's not right. The opposite of sin is love and faith. Morality will arise out of your faith and your ethical decisions and it will be colored by it. Now does what I've said make sense? Anybody have a problem with that? Now, now, lots of times I've had people just just declare that uh, I must be not telling the truth but all, 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 what I would suggest is that you go read a history of the Ku Klux Klan. Uh, in which it has statistics. The Ku Klux Klan began in the South, in Tennessee. But since, 19, since the 1920s, most of the membership has not been in the South. Because northern people are sinners just like everybody else. Now it helped me to learn 
two or three years ago that I'm a northerner. <laughs> because I lived, I lived all my life thinking I was a southerner in origin. Because my grandfather had come to the state of Texas from Tennessee. And I assumed that that meant that probably he had been a Confederate and probably his family had served in the Confederate Army. My sister did a uh, genealogy on our family last year. And I discovered that I was one of those things that when I was growing up was one of the worst things you could be in the world, and that is a Yankee Republican. <laughs> I had to get used to that because I'd been raised to believe that the only good people in the world were Southern Democrats. And so here I find out that my grandfather was one of the few Republicans in Tennessee in 1917, which is one of the reasons why they didn't like him. Uh, another reason why they didn't like him is because he was an illegitimate child and his mother not, never married. So they, they had all kinds of reasons to get rid of him. And that's why he went down to the valley, because there supposedly was no, this was a frontier. But <laughs> the point of all that is that I have had to change, my brain has, has, has had to change its furniture. Because I now, need, I now have to realize that, that not very far back, my ancestors were Yankees, Pennsylvanians, who had served in the Northern Army. And in fact, one of my direct ancestors was a survivor of Chancellorville, which was the southern uh, prison that was so infamous during the Civil War. So all the time I was growing up, I kind of felt like I needed to defend Chancellorville in some way or another, because these were my people. Well, I come to learn that this prison that I was kind of defending because I had this overly, uh, I had this stupid idea of what it means to be a southerner, uh, was a prison that was holding my direct ancestor. So I am the sinner, <laughs> you know, and uh, it, it doesn't make me any less a sinner because I find out that my ancestors were on the Union side in the Civil War. That's interesting. But it doesn't make me any less a sinner. And as long as, as long as we're still making these calculations as to who to love and who to treat with disinterested Christian love, then we're still caught up in that. So I had to be carefully taught not to be a racist. My mother had to be carefully taught not to be a racist. And who was she taught by? She was taught by a little, small Christian sect called the Church of God, Holiness. Otherwise, if she had been uh, a member of, an, of some different Christian sect, I won't name any, but if she had been a member of a different Christian sect, there wouldn't have been any teaching whatever against racism. There would have been teaching against... Uh, uh, dancing and against going out and parking with your girlfriend but there wouldn't have been teach any teaching against racism and so people with good hearts grew up thinking that racism was not their problem and so that's the reason why if you'd gone into this community and you'd ask them all you racist raise your hand oh they wouldn't raise their hand they love those folks they're not going to let them vote but they love them. You know, they're not going to let them get a good job because my kids need a good job. But they love them. You see how this, uh, you see how this works if we don't begin with ourselves. So, for uh, a person does not know in the least what the question is about and cannot possibly learn to know it, or else he knows it and understands it and knows too that no science can explain it. How sin came into the world, every man understands by himself alone. You don't really understand it by looking at the racism of, and the sin of other people. You understand it by yourself alone. If he would learn it from another, he, eo ipso, misunderstands. 
Now what we have to understand and what any good uh, skeptic uh, or agnostic or atheist is very able to describe is that many Christians have no idea what the Christian doctrine of sin is. And so they are still in the habit of looking at other people as sinners instead of beginning with themselves. And as long as they're in the habit of looking at other people as sinners, then their churches are not very redemptive. Because nobody who really knows he's a sinner will want to go to that church. I don't want to go to a church in which I'm beat up on by righteous people. You know, I don't want to do that. Uh, if, I don't want to go to an AA meeting where I'm beat up on by alcoholics because I'm an alcoholic. You know, uh, I don't want to be in a community, whether it's religious or not, in which everybody is righteous but me. And so that's the reason why the universality of the doctrine of sin is so important. It, it actually, ironically, changes the whole tenor of the thing so that a community becomes much more compassionate, much more tolerant, much more, uh, much less racist, much less selfish, and so forth. All of that's still going to be there, and it's going to raise its ugly head every once in a while. But a community like this is a place where you practice this conception of love. It's not a place where you have perfected it. It's a place where you practice it. And what Martin Luther King was trying to do was to try to expand the practice of Christian love into a wider community. That's why his view was nonviolent. Now one thing you will notice that I want to bring out is that if you look in the if you look in the back of this book in the table of contents, you will not find Martin Luther King. Isn't that amazing? How can you write a book on Christian ethics without mentioning Martin Luther King? He's the most important Christian ethicist of the, of the last half of the 20th century. Well, the reason why you won't find him in there is because he was still a kid when this book was written. This, this book was written in the 40s. And you need to understand that when you're reading this chapter on sin and, and Ramsey's analysis of the racism in America. Because uh, there are some white people, sinners, though they are, there are some white people who already knew what needed to be done before Martin Luther came along. And these were people like Paul Ramsey who taught Martin Luther King. And so Martin Luther King considered himself to be a fellow Christian ethicist, a fellow Christian theologian. And so Paul Ramsey kind of was becoming an old man by the time uh, Martin Luther King started his work. So Paul Ramsey, in a sense, just kind of sat back and watched uh, the work that Martin Luther King and other of his students were able to do in the uh, civil rights movement. because of his conception of radical, disinterested Christian love. He thought, man, here's, here's a guy who really has it together. He's still a sinner. I don't know whether you know that or not. Martin Luther King was still a sinner. And every time somebody finds a little bit of sin in his life, they write a book about it as though that meant that anything that he did was of no value. Well, the problem is you can do that with anybody. You can write your little book on anybody. That's the reason why many, many very good moral people refuse to run for public office anymore because if you write a book on them, you can find out they're sinners. But King already knew that. King already knew he was a sinner, and so it didn't bother him near as much for people to find it out. But other more self-righteous po political people, you know, stand up on their... Uh, their uh, soap boxes and talk about the sins of everybody else. So you need to read the uh, writings of Martin Luther King and they've been gathered together by several publications to see that 
without a doctrine of sin, we would have never heard of Martin Luther King. So the modern prejudice against a doctrine of sin. The fact that Martin Luther King believed in the doctrine of sin does not necessarily mean it's true. But it is, it is kind of disingenuous for modern uh, people to write articles, essays, and books on Martin Luther King and never mention that he was a Baptist theologian who believed in the doctrine of sin. Now, uh, he goes on to say that understanding consciousness of sin in this way places the Genesis story in proper perspective. Christians read their Bibles backwards, first the New Testament. In other words, now some Christians don't read the Bible at all, and some, some Christians read the New Testament and never the Old Testament. But Christians read their Bible backwards in the sense that they learn what sin really is only when they contrast themselves with Jesus Christ. And so when they read Genesis then, they're not, they're not uh, trying to derive the doctrine of sin from Genesis because Genesis doesn't prove anything about the doctrine of sin. What they're trying to do when they read Genesis is trying to understand the doctrine of sin. That is, what is what's the ca cause of all this stuff? And what Genesis says about the doctrine of sin, first of all, it's universal. In Adam we sinned all, was the Puritan way of saying it. That is, who is the Adam that sinned, according to Genesis? Well, sometimes we think it was some Jew that lived 6,000 years ago. Well, first, Adam was not a Jew. The word Adam means human being. So Adam represents all human beings. That doesn't mean that we all die because he ate an apple, because first of all, he didn't eat an apple. What he did was exactly what you and I do, and that is we participate in this self-deceptive, idolatrous kind of uh, existence, which is what Christianity means by sin. The word sin itself, if you translate it uh, uh, just specifically, means missing the mark. Now, that doesn't mean simply that if I get drunk, I have missed the mark. Because I am not a sinner because I get drunk. If I get drunk, it's because I'm already a sinner. I'm already missing the mark. I'm already not hitting the goal for which I have been created. So I don't have to wait and see you lying in the gutter to say, you're a sinner. I already know that. Before I ever met you, I knew that. And it's not because I have a prophetic, <laughs> I have a prophetic power, or that I have great psychological insight. I know that because that is the, uh, you know that from, from the perspective of Christian theology, because that is universal. Now, it's universal whether or not Christian theology is correct. Because every philosopher has to have some equivalent of what the Christians mean by sin. They may not like the sin explanation, but they have to have something. Rousseau had to have something. He mentions Rousseau in here. Rousseau had to have something that corresponded to the Christian doctrine of sin. In Rousseau, it was uh, almost, uh, the content of sin was almost civilization. So if we just if we just got back behind civilization to when things were pure and unsinful, uh, then we could get everything straightened out. Marx had another uh, view of sin. His view of sin is uh, the beginning of private property. If we, if we just never go in that direction, then everything would be all right. But no philosopher of any profundity whatever does not have something that corresponds to the Christian doctrine of sin. So uh, we, shouldn't, we shouldn't be ashamed, whether we're Christians or not, we shouldn't be ashamed of the historical Christian doctrine of sin because it's an attempt to try to understand what, can, what, what cannot be skipped over. And so that's the reason why the... Uh, uh, 
the uh, concept of sin is considered to be second only to the concept of the original goodness and the dignity of human beings. First, you've got to get it in your skull that human beings were created good, they were created originally good, they are dignified, they are of infinite value because they are made in the image of God. God is the one that gives them their dignity, he's the one that gives them their value. This conception of original goodness uh, as respects um, ethics is, uh, is, is the part of Christian ethics that, for instance, uh, Thomas Jefferson has picked up on. We hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal. He wasn't so dumb as to say that all men are treated equal. He could see that every day, that that wasn't true. That's the reason why he had a revolutionary war. But he said, we hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created. Well, these truths are not self-evident. They come from a religious tradition. They come from a, a uh, view of the nature of humanity. But uh, that's not the last word. We hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created uh, equal. There's another word that goes along with it. Therefore, we need to kick King George's butt, you know, because he is not, he is, he is, uh, he needs to be restrained. His sin needs to be restrained. And that brings us to the, to the question of Christian love in search of a social policy. The first, now that we see how important the doctrine of sin is, it's not the primary doctrine of Christianity, but with Without the doctrine of sin, you cannot even explicate the primary doctrine of Christianity, that is Christian love. So when you move out into social policy, if sin originates in me, and I am one of the members of this social group, then one of the primary goals of an ethic, social ethic, is the restraint of my sin. Not the restraint of the... Of the uh, not just the restraint of the king's sin, not just the restraint of the, uh, of the elite sin, but I also have to have the restraint of the sin of a good Democrat or a Republican. And so uh, uh, several of the things that are said about sin in this book, for instance, come from people like James Monroe. You've got to restrain sin. And if you don't believe there's any such thing as sin, then what in the world kind of government can you have? That's what government basically is for. To keep people from killing one another. <laughs> the anarchists, you know, that arose in the 19th century and in the 20th century, who went around blowing up people in order to set them free, well, it set them free, you know. But anarchism obviously had a totally inadequate doctrine of sin because they, they didn't understand that if you let people completely free from restraint, they'll go around blowing people up. In other words, there is no better example of why anarchy is not possible than an anarchist. An anarchist considers himself to be righteous enough to determine whether somebody else deserves to die. And, and we have a large, a large group of anarchists uh, developing in little spots all over the United States. You know, we, we're going to have one executed in just a few weeks that uh, blew up the Murrah building in Oklahoma City. He has no, he, he expresses no remorse. If he had killed his own child or even hurt his own child, he probably would have felt some remorse. But this is a righteous cause, you see. This is to set us free from this oppressive FBI and from this oppressive, in other words, see, set us free from all restraint. So somehow or another, as James Monroe says, there has to be some mechanism that recognizes the universality of human sin. Because you can't let guys like that run around 
pronouncing and executing the judgment of God. You also can't let the FBI run around pronouncing and executing the law of God. So there is a sense in which I would agree that the way the FBI dealt with the Waco thing was, a, was, an, was an example of how the American power invested in certain of our armed forces, some, certain, certain of our uh, uh, uniformed people is not properly supervised. Because here's a group of people who comes in contact with a weird group of people. What do you do with a weird group of people? Well, you don't treat them like real people. You just declare them weird. <laughs> you just declare them crazy. Because they, they definitely, Waco Bunch definitely had a different culture from the people, from the people in the ATF and the FBI. They didn't have different religion. All of them were Christians. Most of the FBI people, you know, were good Baptists and other people. But they just couldn't fathom the brains of these people that they were dealing with. So they just thought they were crazy. And they put out things like, well, um, David Koresh claims to be Jesus Christ. Wrong. David Koresh never claimed to be Jesus Christ. David Koresh was not that crazy. David Koresh claimed to be a messiah. But evidently the FBI people, even though they went to church every Sunday, didn't know that the Messiah is a biblical word that can apply to a number of people, not just Jesus Christ. In fact, if it did not already apply to a number of people in the Old Testament, it could not have been used to apply to anybody in the New Testament. So Koresh did claim to be a Messiah. He called himself the sinful Messiah. Well, that's pretty humble. <laughs> he called himself the sinful Messiah. And he did things that are, that are in conflict with our cultural, with the way our culture is developed. He would argue that he didn't do anything that was in conflict with the culture, for instance, of Abraham. So what you had there was a denominational difference that ultimately grew into an American tragedy. And uh, so there's a sense in which I, ha I have feeling for the outrage of some of these guys. But there's absolutely no possibility of somebody doing like this and thinking that he is actually doing righteousness. In other words, if you're going to talk about culpability, even if the FBI and the ATF did do stupid things, you can't Get, make that a moral equivalent of what this guy did in Oklahoma City. But you can look at both of these groups of people and say there are two groups of sinners who are in conflict. And I know that there are two groups of sinners because they look just like me and I am a sinner. Does that make any sense? Are we, trying, are we getting down to the point? So one primary principle of social Christian social ethics has been traditionally formulated as the restraint of sin. Sometimes idealistic moralists, particularly those who didn't want to change the Jim Crow laws, said you can't legislate morality. Bullcorn. That's most of what we try to legislate is morality because most of legislation is for the is for the restraint of sin. That doesn't mean they're correct. That doesn't mean that if you legislate uh, justice for a group of people that you're going to change the hearts of the people that you're restraining. But you can still restrain them. You know, the law against murder is not going to make somebody into a Christian or even to an ethical person. But it, and it's not even going to keep somebody from murdering. It's just an attempt to restrain. And it might be a deterrent to some people. But the primary purpose for the law against murder is that if somebody shoots you, somebody else is going to go jerk him up and throw him in jail and, and uh, try, to, try to provide justice for you. And so the laws 
uh, the civil rights laws that, for instance, Lyndon Johnson finally got through, uh, that Truman and Roosevelt and uh, people like Hubert Humphrey and uh, John Kennedy wanted to get through, but they didn't quite have the courage to do it because of the political situation. Uh, Johnson, whatever his faults, <laughs> this, you know, this uh, slow-talking Texan was able to get through. And it didn't bother him that somebody said, well, you can't legislate morality. He said, I know I can't legislate morality, but I can throw somebody's tail in jail who hurts another member of our community, who is taking away the rights of citizenship. So that's what, that's what Christian ethics means by restraint of sin. If you don't believe in sin, then you might have the tendency to be an idealist, and an anarchist is one of the most idealist people in the world, who thinks that if we all just were as good as I am, then we wouldn't need any laws. But the New Testament itself, even though the New Testament was not written by Democrats or Republicans, it was not written, in fact, in a country in which they could vote. The New Testament still recognizes that there is a need for the restraint of sin. They wish that when they were put in jail and executed that somebody had been able to restrain the sinner. <laughs> But they knew that at least people had to be restrained. And M James Monroe understood that. He was a Puritan. Uh, Jefferson was not, not as much of a Puritan, but he still understood that, uh, in fact, that was a great deal of the fight that was going on among the founders of our country, is just how much restraint was necessary and how much... Um, uh, checks and balances were necessary. The idealist, you see, didn't think you needed very many checks and balances. The idealist, the uh, Enlightenment idealist, thought, well, what we need to do is to make George Washington king. The problem was not with having a king. The problem was having a bad king. But people like... Uh, people like the... Uh, more Puritans of the Founding Fathers said, no, that, that wasn't the problem. The problem wasn't having a bad king. The problem was having a human being who was a sinner who had no checks and balances. And so even if George Washington is one of the best men who ever lived in the world, he still cannot be made into a benevolent dictator. He has to have other people. And and England had learned that through its history, beginning, uh, beginning before the Magna Carta, but then you have the Magna Carta, and then you have the Puritan Revolution. And, the, and, and English democracy is basically a Puritan product, just like American democracy, except that the monarchists finally won back the monarchy, but they didn't get rid of the Puritanism. The Puritanism still expresses itself in the House of Commons and so forth. That is... You can't be king unless we're able to watch you, whether you're a good guy or not. You know, there's, uh, Queen Elizabeth is probably not running around, uh, you know, committing overt sins every day. But she still does not have the power that some of the Enlightenment and other uh, people thought that she might be able to have if she were good, because that's irrelevant. Nixon considered himself to be a very good man. He was what we would call self-righteous. He was what we would call self-deceived. And if it weren't for the Constitution, we would have been in bad trouble. And if it weren't for the Puritan concept of sin, we wouldn't have that Constitution. So we'll talk next time more about the restraint for sin and we will get into the, uh, we still have a minute or two so you can uh, ask your question, but we will, we're, we're going to very soon get into actual case studies such as in the form of uh,
of uh, your book. What's the title of that book? Contemporary Moral. Contemporary Moral. Hmm? Because that's written, this was written in 1949-50. This book was written just recently. And so what he's doing in the, in, in the new book that we're going to read is actually applying Christian ethics to contemporary things. But what I want you to notice is that there's not that much difference between Ramsey writ written in the 40s and this guy written in the 90s because they're both coming from the same basis. And that's the reason why we can...